This week on This is America and the World, our guest is David Litt. Mr. Litt served as special assistant to the president and presidential speechwriter for President Barack Obama. He's currently Washington's head writer and producer for the comedy website, Funny or Die. Mr. Litt is also the author of the new book, Thanks Obama, My Hopi Changey White House Years. David, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on your book. Oh, thank you for having me. How cool, to use your word, how cool is it to ride on the plane? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> and tell the people what the plane is all about. The plane, of course, is, is Air Force One. And while I was at the White House, that was sort of a way that you uh, indicated that you were part of the in crowd was that I never heard anyone call it Air Force One. It was always the plane. You know, uh -huh. or are you getting to go on the plane? And I will say a lot of my book is about how uh, parts of the White House are not as thrilling as you might expect from watching movies or TV. Uh, the plane, Air Force One, is exactly as cool as you would expect. I mean, there, there was nothing quite like that. And, and uh, there was one time I actually flew on Air Force One for work back and forth from D.C. to Kansas City. And then that night I flew coach to uh, cross country to LA and I was in my middle seat thinking, you know, <laughs> I really have experienced all the travel possibilities in one day. Uh -huh. Take us uh, from, uh, from entering the plane and what is the configuration of the plane? What happens in each of the sections? So the way Air Force One is set up is it's sort of, um, in my book I described it as a Russian nesting doll of access, but that was one of those terms that changed a little bit between 2016 when I wrote the book and uh, 2017 when it came out. And what I meant was you can always move up, uh, or sorry, you can always move back, rather, in, from cabin to cabin, but you, have, you need permission to move up. So the president's uh, personal quarters and his office are at the very nose of the plane, and then you go back and you get to the senior staff conference room, and you go back one step further, and you get to the staff cabin. That's where people like me would be seated. Then you go and you're in the guest cabin, and then finally in the back are the reporters, and, and that's to make sure that the reporters don't go up and overhear anything unless they have permission to go wander around. Uh-huh. So how many press would travel with the president on a trip? You know, I don't know because it was... Uh, <laughs> you never went back there. Because they, they were in their <laughs> cabin. But it, it, there were people who's you know, the press wranglers, and their job was to take the press and move them from place to place. So we'd sometimes see each other. But um, one of the things about being a speechwriter is very few of us engaged with the press. It was a very, you know, sort of walled-off... Um, uh, world between one office and the other. And what's up there for the president? What when you say kind of his area? What's well, what's so there? <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't hanging out there. No, uh, but you a lot, know. But, but, you yeah, know. they took us on a tour. So you, um, before the president got there, uh, they would take new people who hadn't been on the plane before. You get to a tour of the whole aircraft. And I remember, I think he, you know, there was a bed, and he has an office. You know, with, sometimes you see pictures of that an office with a desk. Um, and I think they, they told me they had a, you know, like a TV set up so uh, um, the family could like uh, bring on a Nintendo Wii if they were all traveling together or something like that. Uh -huh. And the, um, the mo most of the time though President Obama would spend in the senior staff cabin. So I was uh, in the regular staff cabin and then the senior staff conference table, he'd usually be playing cards or kind of talking with personal aides. It, he, he was generally up there unless he was in the office working. Huh. And so your time in the White House, you were just in your 20s, right? For the entire period of time you are in your 20s. That's right. I, I started when I was 24 and I left when I was 29. Now, uh, you got a designation toward the end as special assistant to the president. What are the perks that come with that title? Special, and people are watching right now and they're seeing you as a very young person. Uh, so what are the perks? Well, so there's three... Uh, tiers to what are officially the White House senior staff. So does that mean a caste system? <laughs> I, I, I guess that's one way you could call it. It's certainly no, not. No, you way called I, it that way in the book. Did I call it that way? <laughs> yes, in the book? you did. A oh, caste system. well, then uh, <laughs> don't don't hang me with that. Yeah, all right. Well, I'll hang myself then. Um, yeah. Well, the way it worked was uh, so you had assistants to the president. They were the most important. Then you had deputy assistants to the president, and then special assistant to the president. Wow. And that's what I was uh -huh. when I left. And so what that meant was I was sort of on the very junior most rungs of the senior staff. But that came with some nice job perks. You know, one of the things I write about is the White House is this extraordinary place, but it's also an office building. And so you keep track of what you're allowed to do at work. If you get that parking pass where you can park inside the complex, 
that's really convenient. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you can order frozen yogurt from the Navy Mess, um, that, that's a nice treat, especially because they have very good frozen yogurt. Uh -huh. And so that was, you know, I could bring people to lunch at the Mess. That was always fun. Um, you know, uh, you get to order a, a chocolate freedom, the, the signature dessert of the White House Navy mess and, and watch your guests sort of have this <laughs> out of body experience. Uh -huh. So there were uh, there were a lot of fun perks that came with it. But the, the actually the most uh, important or the, the one that I cared most about was um, in the Obama White House and in theory, all White Houses, there's a, a bright line drawn between doing campaign work and official government work. And so also as a special assistant, you get to work on more things if you're a speechwriter. I could write campaign speeches in addition to official government business. Ah. Um, if you're working in the White House as a special assistant to the president at that age, is there a sense of uh, entitlement? Is there a sense of mm, arrogance that you know, kind of just goes along with that kind of a job? Well, I, I think by definition I'd be I mean, the worst. I would be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'd be the worst person to answer that question because if uh, you know if there is, I probably wouldn't notice it. Uh, by definition, I, I think that uh, it is a strange thing, and I I tried to acknowledge this in my book. It's there is a strange thing whether you're in your twenties and you're a junior staffer at the White House, or you're anybody at the White House of, at any level, any age, of uh, how much your actions matter compared to the fact that you're still just a person. And mm -hmm. that is a paradox for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it is difficult. Uh, and I think people respond to it in different ways. So I, I think it's important, certainly is important for me to, to recognize that and to think through that. I'm sure there were times when, you know, I was, uh, in, in the book I, I mentioned, you know, on the phone with uh, airline customer service or something, and I would think to myself, like, don't you know who I am? And then yeah, be like, yeah. oh my God, what did I just do? <laughs> yeah. I never said it, just uh -huh. to be very clear. But I had those moments where I was, and I think those yeah. were some of the moments where I began to realize, like, okay, I'm glad that at some point this job is is going to stop, because uh -huh. this is not normal. Yeah. Uh, let me say, uh, say to the folks at home, we're talking with, uh, actually, uh, I should say the Honorable David Litt, because along with your title, uh, you could be addressed that way, right? I, I think honor you're the first person to do that, but yes. Yes, the <laughs> Honorable David Litt. But on the other hand, the first time you met with the president, did he not, not pronounce your name correctly and call you Lips? Well, the the first time I met with the president, actually, you he, just froze. Huh? Yeah, he he uh, <laughs> he had my said my first name correctly. He said, "How's it going, David?" And I have no idea what I said. Um, I, I I literally blacked out. Uh, a few years later, I I had sort of been in a couple of meetings, but lots of people meet the president, you know, once or twice a year, and I was one of those people. So he had no reason to remember my name, and I was there to talk about some some jokes that I had written because um, that was sort of my Specialty at the White House was doing the jokes, and my my boss. <laughs> That's a great job. It's a pretty good job. Yeah, if, if anyone offers you it, uh, you, you should take it. It was, it was a very good job, and my boss uh, at the time, the chief speechwriter Cody Keenan, pointed at me and said, "Well, the president said, you know, are we funny?" And Cody said, "Well, Lit's pretty funny," and the president, I could under see he was confused for a second, but then he decided to keep going with it. He said, "Yeah, Lips." is pretty funny. Ah. And, and I remember thinking, you you know, if the president gets your name wrong, you can't correct <laughs> him. I mean, he's got more important stuff to do. So I just thought, oh, okay, I guess I'm lips now. <laughs> and, uh, and I was lips for a few months, I guess. Uh, thanks, Obama. My hopey, changey White House years. David Litt is the author of the book. And it is a wonderful, uh, fun book. Uh, going behind the scenes of things around the White House, at the White House. And we'll talk about President Obama in just a second. Uh, sit tight. This is America and the World. This is America and the World is brought to you by the Libra Group, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, John and Mary Papajohn, the American Hellenic Institute, the U.S.-China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Ambassador Julia Chang Block, President. The National Hellenic Society, preserving Hellenic heritage in America. Katerina Panagopoulos. The Barakis Foundation. The League of Arab States. The Rotondaro Family Trust. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, 
presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. Give us uh, a little bit of a, a picture of what goes on in, in the White House side and what's over there, and then what I used to call the EOB, the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. What, what, what's the difference? Who's where? And tell us a little bit about the offices and so on and so forth. So, so the West Wing itself is... Oh, the West Wing. The, the, the actual <laughs> West Wing is on, uh, it, it's on one side of this sort of pedestrian street that's inside the White House complex called West Exec. And the EEOB is this big five-story giant office building on the other. And I worked in the EEOB. Most of my colleagues did too. So most people you meet, if they say, I work in the White House, what they mean is they work in the executive office building. And that's one of the things that uh, I think a lot of people don't realize just watching the West Wing, the show, or um, you know, Veep or something like that is there's actually a lot more White House staff than you think. And most of them were like me, kind of running around, not making history every single day, but just trying to do our little part of our job well uh, in order to help the president do his very, very big job just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit better. Mm -hmm. and, and then the West Wing itself would hold senior staff and a few special assistants. So, for example, the chief speechwriters, John Favreau in the, co uh, in the, in the first term and Cody Keenan in the second term, um, they both were, they would have their offices in the West Wing, and so we would have our speech writing team meetings there, and then most of us would go back across the street to the EEOB. Mm. Uh, you, uh, in the course of the book, are uh, in a relationship, or that develops as the, uh, as the book uh, continues along. I would imagine it would be rather hard on the partner of someone uh, because of incessant use of uh, a BlackBerry at the time, always being on call, uh, burning out. Uh, how do those things affect uh, you on a personal level? How did it affect uh, her on a personal level? Well, it is uh, one of the uh, downsides, for sure, of dating a White House employee is that at any moment, uh, you know, my BlackBerry could start buzzing and I would say, okay, this was a great date, but I need to run back to work. Yeah. And that's something you sort of, you know, it comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Jackie, my, now my fiance at the yeah. time, my girlfriend, when we met, she was in her third year of law school. So it was sort of a, a fair trade where uh -huh. uh, she was b in law school, which is overwhelming in its own way. And I had a job that was equally overwhelming. So it, neither of us felt like uh, we were necessarily getting a, an unfair deal. But then the other thing is, um, you know, every so often you do get to make it up to uh, to somebody. So I would be able to take Jackie to date night in the president's box at the Kennedy Center because Ooh, they would give nice. away tickets uh -huh. if the president and the first lady weren't using them. So we'd get to, you know, dress up all fancy and go to the opera. And they have a mini fridge that is very well stocked with champagne and beer. And so uh, <laughs> you'd say, okay, well, this one makes up for that time when we were at dinner and I uh -huh. had to leave halfway through. At least I hope it does. You'd have to ask her. <laughs> uh, I used to see George Stephanopoulos walking into the president's box under the uh, 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 Clinton administration. And he would be wearing jeans and a, and a, and a sweatshirt or <laughs> something like that. So you dressed up. That was rather nice. Well, maybe that's the, the flip side of it, right, is that if you're uh, senior enough at the White House, you're like, oh, oh I, this is my time. This is my casual time. Uh -huh. And if you're a, a more, you know, a younger, more junior staffer like me, you're like, oh, we get to get fancy now. This is going to be good. <laughs> uh, just triggered in my mind, you said that Clinton's ego was that uh, he, he, he craved the power. But you said that uh, President Obama, uh, his ego was that he deserved the position. That's an interesting thing to say. Well, right. yeah, what I was uh, talking about was I, I think that any president, sort of by definition, they need to have a very high opinion of themselves. Sure. They need to look at the world's most important job and say, yeah, I think I could do that. But I think um, different presidents' sort of egos express themselves differently. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that for, uh, for Clinton, um, this was a part of the book where I'm talking about how it always seemed to me, and talking with people who, who worked for uh, Bill Clinton, that he kind of loved the drama of being president, that he, mm -hmm. he enjoyed playing himself in the movie version of his life. <laughs> and for President Obama, I got the feeling that he didn't enjoy the drama. He was very good at the performative side of politics, but I don't think that he enjoyed that in the way that some politicians do. I think he genuinely believed that I'm the right person for this job, which is a, an extraordinary statement to make, although I happen to agree with him. But, um, you know, that is, uh, by definition, that's a pretty uh, hefty thing to think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think that that um, uh, was a slight difference between those two presidents, and it was 
one of those ways where I felt like while I was not in the president's inner circle, maybe I got glimpses into what made President Obama unique um, that I wouldn't have gotten if I hadn't been lucky enough to work in the White mm -hmm. House. Uh, does everybody think, uh, and you just kind of put your finger on it right now, does everybody think that if you're working at the White House, you're in the presence of the president all the time? Oh, yeah. And, 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 and that's not true, huh? <laughs> it's not true for everybody. For yeah. a handful of people, it's true. For me, you know, my family and friends assumed that I had direct access to the president yeah. of the United States. So, you know, I have the, the, <laughs> the many, many emails from family members suggesting policies. My, my grandfather uh, would, you know, he'd be up at night and he had a plan for a national network of water pipelines. And I say now that like 50 years we're going to uh, have the, you know, there's going to be a national network of water pipelines. And I'm going to think, man, grandpa really had it right. <laughs> but uh, he, it was very, it was very charming uh -huh. because he would say, well, could you at least, could you run this by your people? And I thought, well, it's, it's nice that he thinks I have people. Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm somebody's people, and I don't think I get to run this by anybody. There you go. But there it, you was go. A, it was a vote of confidence, I guess. It was very uh, nice. Let's talk about the president, President Obama. Uh, everything I, I, I'm reading uh, from, uh, and you mentioned playing cards on a cross-country trip. He'd be playing cards with people. Uh, that uh, he was not above any trash talking. That's for darn sure. But calm uh, to a point where it was maddening to people. Uh, he was always whistling. What was that all about? <laughs> I, well, no one really knows. I talk about this in uh, in the book. <laughs> Driving that, people crazy. Well, that it was, you know, uh, he. Well, I wouldn't say crazy because again, he's the president, so you're, you're going to say <laughs> you give him, cut him a little. Yeah, slack. you get a pass, I think. But it was uh, it was the kind of thing where you would sort of hear the whistling coming, and you'd say, "Okay, I better you know sit up extra straight." Uh -huh. and, and then, as the whistling grew louder and louder, then the, the president would come in. And it was, um, you know, uh, in the in the White House, as with many things, you don't without it meaning to. It was kind of informally a barometer of how close you were. That if you were really annoyed by the whistling, it meant you spent a lot of time with the president. Uh -huh. uh, you know, if it was just a casual observation, as it was in my case, uh, it meant you were maybe occasionally around the president, but it, you were not nearly uh, quite as important on the staff. <laughs> I, I thought this was a, 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 a dramatic thing that you wrote in the book. and I, At least I took it this way. When somebody was talking to him about playing golf or playing golf again or more golf, and the line you quote in the book was, I thought, so revealing. He said, this is the only time I get to be outside. Wow. Yeah. That, when that sinks in, that's true, I guess, kind of, huh? Yeah, it, it was one of the things that I felt fortunate wow. about when I was writing a book because I was not writing about, you know, all the historic decisions I made because I did not make any historic <laughs> decisions. I was, you know, I was there, but I was not saying, well, we have to go get bin Laden today. That was yeah. not my job. Um, but what that freed me up to do was write about some of these glimpses into uh, a president and a person that I had, where in this case, you know, I, I like everybody, knew how much... Um, Republicans would, you know, attack the president for playing golf. They'd make fun of him, um, and they'd, you know, suggest why is he spending so much time on the golf course. And so, hearing that when he was talking to our press secretary when this happened, he said, "Jay, you know, that's the only time I get to go outside." Wow. I thought I really, you know, I had this moment where I didn't really remember that behind this office, behind this persona, and this this person I admire is also just a human being. And every so often, you see that, and I thought that was a, a special moment in that way. Mm. Uh, give me a minute version of um, what obsessed you, if that's the right way to say it, obsessed you with uh, Obama at the beginning uh, and, and how you worked your way from uh, volunteer to organizer to Washington in turn to Valerie Jarrett. Well, uh, I was one of those college kids who didn't know what they wanted to do my senior year. It was 2008. And I saw President Obama give a speech. I was watching on television. And by the time the speech ended, I was a different person. I said, you know, whatever he's doing, I want to be a small part of that. Mm -hmm. And so after I graduated <clears throat> in 08, I drove to Ohio. I worked as a field organizer in Worcester, Ohio on the campaign. And then I moved to Washington, D.C. with no real plan, just you know, hope and change. And <laughs> I, I got here, and I was briefly the world's worst intern. Uh, and since this is the one-minute version, I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll skip over that for a second. And then I ended up, uh, pretty much just by luck, getting an internship that turned into a job at a speechwriting firm called West Wing Writers. And they did speeches for CEOs and senators and uh, private sector work. And so I got to learn this skill that I didn't really know existed. And a couple years after that, uh, Valerie Jarrett, who was the president's senior advisor, 
she was looking for a speechwriter and had not been able to find somebody. And so the chief speechwriter, John Favreau, said, you know, your references are pretty good. Uh, if you apply for this job, you'd basically at this point be the only person applying. So want to do that? And I was like, yeah, you know, twist my arm. I could do that. Huh. Um, and so that's how I ended up writing for, for Valerie and then for other senior staff and gradually uh, more and more for the president as well. Uh, she had a lot of power, didn't she? She did. Well, she, <coughs> what I write about in the book was that she, in addition to being a senior advisor to the president, and there were several senior advisors, and that's a very powerful role, um, she also knew President Obama uh, better than almost anybody in the White House. Mm -hmm. And that was um, something that was really special for me as a speechwriter because of eventually working for the president, but starting off writing for someone who had this really deep understanding and this longtime friendship with the president and first lady, I felt like I got to uh, experience that a little bit vicariously mm -hmm. while writing Valerie's speeches. And I think in some way, it probably helped me write the president's speeches when I moved over to writing for him. Is there a trick to writing speeches for the president and also President Obama? Well, I think <clears throat> any president, the trick to writing speeches is to remember that the audience is the entire country, no matter what the speech is about. And that was something I didn't always realize at first. I write about some speeches that didn't go so well that I wrote. Uh, and often my mistake was I would write about one specific policy issue for one specific group of people in the room. But mm. really, it needs to be about America. Uh, you know, the, the question that President Obama would always go back to is, who are we as a country? And every speech has to address that question. Every audience is the entire United States. Um, and writing speeches for Obama in some ways was uh, way easier than almost any other speechwriting job because he's such a good speaker mm. that no matter what was on the page, he was going to make it look better than it, than it really was. Um, but I will say part of that, too, was learning, for example, that writing for President Obama, you could write very long sentences because he had the ability to punctuate sentences on his own, to kind of build to these crescendos. And so you, you had opportunities to... Uh, kind of try things that you wouldn't get to do writing for most people, even people I admire. Does speech, speeches go back and forth? Uh, other people signing off on them and checking them and then the president adding a few lines here and there? For a, for a very big speech, like the State of the Union, the president and the chief speechwriter would work on that collaboratively for a long time. For most speeches I did, um, I would send them to the chief speechwriter the day before and uh, he would make edits, or, or two days before. The night before, the president would make some edits. And then the day of, the president would deliver the speech. Um, but it depended on the, on the specific set of remarks, too. For jokes, for example, because they're always new and because they have to be so precise, we might meet three or four times in the Oval Office mm -hmm. to go over every joke. It really depended on the speech. You had your own incident with Harvey Weinstein. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, <laughs> I did. I mean, it, it pales in comparison yeah, yeah. to it was, it was not everything a... that's come out since. Yeah. But so I was writing a, a speech um, on during the 2012 convention for Scarlett Johansson and Kerry Washington. Yep. And Harvey Weinstein was the sort of uh, the producer of this little a aspect of the convention. He was the driving force behind it. And so my job was to uh, make sure that the speeches didn't go over time. Um, because the president was speaking that night. It's the convention. You can't push the president's speech out of prime time. That could be bad for the campaign. Uh, but Harvey was not exactly happy that I um, wanted to try to cut the speeches down to the three and a half minutes that we were allotted. And so I got these calls where somebody would say, I have Harvey Weinstein for you. And I'd say, really? And then I would get a lot of yelling on the other end. And it, you know, it's one of those stories that at the time, and I, and I wrote it this way, it sort of felt uh, surreal but harmless. And I was uh, lucky because basically at the end of the yelling, I would say, well, I think you're looking for someone who can actually make a decision. Uh, let me find that person for you. Yeah, you were good. So <laughs> I, I was not, uh, <clears throat> it didn't affect me in that way. But it is also one of those moments where looking back on it, um, you know, it, it does feel obviously a, a little different. It feels like um, you sort of are reminded that uh, people who misuse their power, uh, that's not confined to one political party or one set of people, and it's, it's always a problem. You know, for me, it remains kind of a, a strange and funny story, but the stuff that's come out since makes it, you know, a little bit of a different light. But in the book, he comes across certainly as a bully and bully to you and a braggart about how many Oscars he's won and so on and so forth. And you did go right back at him and say, let me find somebody who can handle this. Uh, we're coming at the end of our time. Uh, biggest lesson you learned in your time at the White House? Number one lesson. The number one lesson I learned is that when you 
are a kid, you think that there are these all-knowing grown-ups who will do everything and they, they'll take care of it. And I think one of the things I learned is that we have to be our own grown-ups. Everybody's a person just trying to do their best. And so uh, it, it's up to us to act like the adults we thought were running the world when we were kids. Thanks, Obama, is the title of David's book. Uh, terrific behind-the-scenes adventure with you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much. For information about This Is America and the World and to watch all of our programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and look for us on Facebook and Twitter. You can listen to all of our Ambassador interviews on our podcast, The Ambassador Series. It's available on our website and iTunes. This is America and the World is brought to you by the Libra Group, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, John and Mary Papajohn, the American Hellenic Institute, the U.S. China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Ambassador Julia Chang Block, President. The National Hellenic Society, preserving Hellenic heritage in America. Katerina Panagopoulos. The Barakis Foundation. The League of Arab States. The Rotondaro Family Trust. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings.